Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our presentation tonight on artificial intelligence and how it empowers speakers of endangered languages like Lemko. My name is Marianne Sivak. I am a founding member and current president of the Carpathia Russian Society. The Society is a nationwide cultural organization representing people who came from or whose ancestors, excuse me, emigrated from the Carpathian Mountains of Central Europe. Our goal is to preserve and promote um, their heritage and inform the public about Carpathian Russians. The most effective ways we do this are by education, tracing genealogies, and documenting the work our ancestors did to enrich American culture. This program has led many to discover their roots and heritage. Uh, the society, however, is open to everyone who shares our goals, regardless of religious or ethnic affiliation. So today it is a real pleasure for me to introduce you to Pete Oranich Gleason. Although I have never met him, I heard a lot of wonderful things about him. So Pete uh, is a software developer, computer programmer, computational linguist, and Silicon Valley consultant. His research currently focuses on artificial intelligence, neural mach machine translation, and hybrid system for endangered indigenous language revitalization. He received his degree in Russian at the Institute of East Slavic Philology of Jagiellonian University in Krakow in Poland, where he worked for Google during its 2016 uh, neural machine translation artificial intelligence breakthrough. His engines were recently cited in the uh, Cambridge uh, University Press Journal called Natural Language Engineering. Um, Pete also has two decades of transatlantic experience as a linguist specializing in Russian, Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, and Lemko. Among his clients or top language service providers, national defense, heavy industry, and companies like Raytheon, Amazon, Siemens, and Mercedes-Benz Daimler. So go ahead, Pete. Pete. Please welcome Pete. Okay, I'm unmuted. Pleasure to meet you all. Uh, first of all, thanks to everyone who made it out. Really appreciate your presence here. We got a great turnout, 57 people. That's amazing. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you for the introduction, Marianne. Much appreciated. Help to go to the beginning. We have laser pointer. Okay, we'll dive right in, and then we're going to do uh, questions and free discussion at the end. Uh, the, go ahead. So I can't hear you. I think someone's mic picked up. The title of tonight's presentation is "There is an app for that." Uh, it's about AI neural machine translation empowering speakers of endangered languages like Lemko, for example. And let's just dump right in. So what's the problem? The problem is we're in the middle of a language mass extinction event. 3,000 of the world's languages are endangered. That's out of 7,000. So about 42% of the world's languages are endangered. As many as 90% could be extinct by 2050. Not good. Meanwhile, what do we have against that? Google Translate, for example, only services 108 languages, which is less than 2%. And moreover, that's the 2% of the highest resource languages. So things are not looking good for low resource endangered languages. However, the language we're gonna be looking at tonight is called Lemco. Uh, it meets, me. go ahead. I think somebody's mic picked up, it's all good. See something in the chat. All right, yeah, be sure to mute your mic. Thanks, Antonita. 
Lemko meets traditional criteria for classification as East Slavic, which basically means that torch sequences are related to Torah. The Slavists here will know that. Um, it's standing relative to standard Ukrainian, Polish, and Rus, and as codified in Slovakia, it's, it's complicated. We won't be able to go into that tonight, unfortunately. How many speakers are there? The Polish Census Bureau counted 6,279 in 2011, which is up from 5,602 in 2002. Uh, they just finished the, the recent count, and those numbers are going to come out next January, so I have a better picture of that. They'll probably be going up. Uh, Lemko is seriously endangered, meaning uh, language transmission is increasingly absent and there are fewer and fewer younger speakers. It's low resource and basically what that means uh, from a linguist point of view is there's just few data sets available. There's a few bilingual corpora. But the situation's improving. We've got more and more uh, data on the way. A lot of it was recorded and we've got 60,000 uh, bilingual Lemco English um, data sets, and that's good, and about half a million monolingual Lemco uh, data. All right, let's go to the next slide. What other problems do we have? We'll go through the problems before the solutions. People who can't read endangered languages are at risk of social exclusion from their own communities. Uh, a short-term solution, which is to switch to the language of the majority or the colonial power, worsens the, the endangerment situation in the long term. So it's a short term fix to switch to English, for example, or to switch to Polish, but it just makes things worse long term. Uh, meanwhile, low resource endangered language communities simply lack resources for short, other short term solutions like translating texts, unfortunately, to reach those left behind. All right, let's see if we can go to the next slide. Next. What were the old solutions out there? Well, the first solution, or probably the best solution, is human translation. I myself worked as a human translator for about two decades on both sides of the Atlantic. Human translation is the gold standard for quality. Low initial investment, about a couple hundred dollars worth of computer software, another couple hundred dollars in computer hardware. But it's a short-term solution. You translate an article, and, and that's it. There's manpower issues. There's not a lot of well-qualified professional translators out there. Uh, there's a lot of bilingual people, but very few professional translators. It's time consuming and it, it costs a lot of money. Another old solution was statistical uh, translation. Think about Google Translate from the bad old days. Machine translation was good because it empowers individuals. They can translate things on their own. It's fast, it doesn't cost anything or it didn't cost much. Uh, and it's easy to keep going, but the quality was terrible. It's a high initial investment if you want to hire programmers to, to make those engines. And those engines are generally unavailable for endangered and low resource languages. Another solution is classroom education, which is great because it empowers individuals, whether they're adults or children. It is a long-term solution, but there's manpower issues. There's few teachers out there. Uh, that situation's improving, but it's going to take a while. Uh, students aren't going to be outputting good quality at the beginning. It's going to take them a while to get to that point if they ever get there. And it's time consuming. I used to teach English um, abroad and to get someone fluent can take tens of thousands of hours, if not more. So that's another hard solution. Now we've got another option, which is called neuro machine translation, which is an artificial intelligence technology. In 2016, Google engineers repurposed image recognition software. Think about those catch buds you see, right? When you have to pick up the trucks, for example, to prove you're not a robot, that's that. They repurposed this technology to translate from one natural human language to another. So it looks like a human wrote it or a native speaker wrote it. It can still make mistakes, but it's all that more dangerous. It doesn't look like Google Glock like it did in the old days. Another problem with this is it requires huge amounts of bilingual text to get a working uh, machine out there. So what do we do? We're not going to have lots of uh, endangered language text, so we're going to use the neural network from other languages and we're going to transfer them. So we call that transfer learning. In this case, for Lemco, we're going to be using uh, Polish English engines and to some extent uh, Ukrainian English engines. In the battle of days, quality took time. A professional language uh, linguists can do about three pages in an hour if you want it publication quality, maybe even four pages on a good day for some pretty uh, complicated text. Once you factor in the whole supply chain, for example, in the United States, one page can take you days and hundreds of dollars. So that's not going to be a sustainable solution for most um, 
communities, unfortunately. But now we've got pretty much instant translation. The app we're going to show you tonight can do 17,000 words an hour. Last time I checked, real time is 9,000 words an hour. I'm probably speaking to you right now at about 6,000 words an hour. So this is going to be faster than you can think, faster than you can even talk. So that allows new wow. speakers to message each other, to write each other, um, to really be full-fledged members of society. Let's look at that speed. We did some tests earlier uh, in the year, and I translated 798 words an hour from Lemco into English. The machine on an old but beat up laptop did 3,000. I did Polish 640 words an hour. Our machine did 3,668. I did 509 Russian words per hour, and the machine did 6,456. So the machine was about 10 times faster than me at translating from Russian into English, for example. And that's on an old beat up laptop. Again, I'm talking at about 6,000 words an hour, which is real time. And the Russian engine was already there using minimal hardware. So this stuff is fast. I just clocked it this morning at 40,134 40, words per minute. So that's seven times faster than people talk in real time and definitely faster than we can think. So, this is going to be game-changing technology. We went from one page taking days to one page taking less than a second. Let's see if we can go to the next slide. Another problem in the past was quality. People make mistakes. Linguists make mistakes. I was a linguist. I made mistakes. Why? It's just the air is human. People double book for whatever reason, and uh, they work long hours. They get tired, and mistakes happen. Statistical machine translations, the old Google got Google of the old days made lots of mistakes and it just wasn't good enough. So quality, there were quality issues in the past. How do we gauge those quality issues? Everybody's a critic. People can always pick apart everything, uh, but we need an objective measure. Fortunately, military did develop that technology about 20 years ago and it's called the blue score. It's an objective, replicable, real-time and cost-effective measure of translation quality. So we can measure translation quality uh, in an objective manner without just picking it apart. Now, using those objective measures, we can say, and I was shocked by this finding this spring, that the machines are getting better than people, if not much better. In our case, for Russian English translations, the machines were 50% better. Why? People make mistakes, people are tired. Uh, it happens, typos, right? And um, by this objective measure, the machines are up to 50% better than people for Russian English translation and Polish English translation. So let's look at that. For Lemco, our quality score was uh, 19 for our machine, which is pretty good. Uh, human, that was me, was at 28. So the humans are still better than the machines for translating from Lemco. Meanwhile, for Polish English, I scored 30.53 and the machines scored 35. So the machine beat me. The machine was better than man. For Russian, I scored 24.86. Again, this was cut off from the internet in a high security setting at the end of a long week late at night. So mistakes happen. And the machine scored 39.37. This was for NATO training material. And those are just the numbers. Um, I was quite shocked by this, that, that machines can be better than people, but now they are. Now let's zero in on the topic of today's conversation. We're not talking about Russian or Polish tonight, we're talking about Lemco. And we've got three um, ways to tackle this problem here. Here's me, I did a 28.66 quality score uh, from Lemco into English. The machine we're gonna be looking at tonight did 15.74. So just so everyone can gauge their expectations. The machine is about half as good as a professional human translator. So it's not going to be amazing quality that we're going to see tonight, but it hopefully will be good enough for a lot of people's purposes. Okay, Google Translate, meanwhile, recognizes Lemco as standard Ukrainian and runs it. And it used to be terrible, but they put a lot of money into it lately. I even work for them sometimes and moonlight for them. And their quality score is up to 13.39 when it's running on Lemco. So that's another option for people out there, and that's something to be aware of. We're going to try to keep our machine better than Google Translates, but um, and I think we will. But that's just an interesting thing to, to mention. So if you 
run Lemco through Google Translate, you'll get the readable results at this point, but ours are still better. All right, next slide. And now we're going to try it out. So let me see if I can chat with everybody. If you can open a web browser and go to www.lemcotran.com, you're going to get this window here and you're going to be able to try it out. You press the go button. It's going to translate from Lemco into English. And tonight we're going to go to Lem FM and we're going to see how it works. So let's see, can anyone, uh, how do I chat with you guys? I'm kind of Zoom illiterate here. Where is the chat window? So let's open a browser and we're going to go to www.lemcotran.com. And you should get this screen to pop up. Okay, here's our translation engine. Is that working for anybody? Can somebody uh, from the audience pipe up and let me know if it's working? Oh, here we go. The chat's popping up. Sure. Sarah right. Schmoller. It's working. It's working. Let me type in that address here for you guys. You should be able to just click the link and it'll come up. Marianne, it's working. Jeffrey, it's work. Awesome. You guys rock. Thanks so much. Okay. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go to, um, if you want to learn Lemco, a good place to start is Lem FM. They publish pretty much every day articles in the language, and you can start to learn your language. All right. So here's Lem FM. This is the endangered language site. It's uh, funded partially by the Polish government, and we're going to be translating this right now. A lot of you can read Lemko, and this author here is a great guy, but that's not the dialect that he's writing in that this engine is for. Uh, Petr Medvit is from Slovakia, and he writes in Rusin. Uh, but right now, this engine is, is optimized for Lemko as spoken in the Krakow region. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing. Tonight, we're going to be translating this article. So if everybody could scroll down, here's the article we're going to be translating about um, Teofil Kuriwo. And I'm going to be sending you guys a link right here. You can all, here's the link. I think this is somebody's relative that this is about. We were talking earlier today. I think you're in the audience, yeah. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're just going to copy this this headline right here. So we're just going to highlight it and copy it. And then we're going to go back to our translator and just paste it in. All right. And hit go. Boom. We got the translation. 130 years ago, Teofo Kurduo, a leading representative of the Electrical Intelligentsia, was born. Now we can also plug it into Google Translate. And let's see what we get. Theophilus Crew, a leading representative of the Lemco Intelligentsia, was born 130 years ago. So that's also a pretty good translation. And it detects it as Ukrainian for whatever that's worth. So how's it going? Anyone, did that not work for anybody? Work for anybody? Somebody brave can just pipe up. Work for Gina. All right, work for Sarah. Frank, that's your relative, right? That's your relative, really. Christina, thanks, it worked. Yeah, it worked here. All right. Sometimes the engine will overheat, just try it again until it works. But uh, well, I'm really happy to see Christian. All right, man, glad to see you, bro. Steve, all right. So now we can just go through and we can just, um, just paste it in and do another one. Okay, we got a button here. You can donate the data to science and then we'll be able to go through it and um, we can use it to bug it. If you don't want anyone reading what you're sending, just unclick that and it'll be super secret and it won't be saved anywhere, I promise. Um, <laughs> great to hear that. Oh, thanks, Wojciech. Great to see you, bro. Awesome. All right. So that's that. Also, what you have here is a uh, transcription. For all you uh, linguists out there, here's the international romanization. 
right, which is kind of based more on the Croat or, or Czech alphabet. Um, for all of our American audiences here, here's the Americanized spelling so you know how to pronounce it. So you can just read it, Zapisal, like you just would American English. Uh, and hopefully that'll be useful. All right, let's go back to our presentation. Now here's the red meat for all you linguists out there. We're gonna get into the nitty gritty. Here's our source text and we're just gonna tear it apart. So the first thing that's interesting here is this last name. And Frank, I think this is my, one of your um, great great grandpas or something. So this might be interesting for you. Kurewa, Google Translate, you, Google did uh, with the C right here, which is kind of weird. And our engine got it right, or at least using the Polish alphabet, the regional alphabet. Uh, let's see, we got this word Polony Volinia and Ukrainian English Google Translate said it's enslavement, which is not the case because this is about the opening period of World War I when um, Russia declared war in Austria and a lot of um, Rusins were, or Lemkos were arrested because they were considered to be potential Ru Russian sympathizers. So enslavement's not the word here that Google had. And uh, our engine did subjugation, which is, which is more likely. This is interesting. The author here said, uh, did Veresnia and then September. So he, what he's doing is he's using the Slavic word for September and then the Latin word, putting them next to each other. Because in the Czech Republic, for example, they don't, they don't know the Latin word and uh, vice versa in Slovakia. So he's putting both out there. So people from both sides of the mountains can read it. Uh, Google translates September twice in that case, whereas our engine doesn't. Next, we got this village here. This is the um, blockative case for a village called Rosjela, Rosjela in Polish. Uh, Google translates that as Rosdil, which is not really right. And here we got the Polish, current name of the village in Polish for better or worse, so people can Wikipedia it. And I've got that Wikipedia pulled up so you guys can see it. Let's see. Here's the village, right? And then you got the Lemko right here, Rosdila. Right, what else was there? Google leaves out of the earliest, early 20th century, which is this right here. And we got that in ours of the early 20th century. Meanwhile, our engine admitted the phrase was born, whereas Google did. So it's not perfect. About 50% human accuracy, but it's better than nothing. Uh, Frank, you want to spell that with two L's there. Yeah, Cordillo, with two L's. All right, hard L's if you really want to get into it with those little bars. <laughs> so to wrap up, goodbye language barrier, hello new world. New speakers can now read instantly in their endangered languages. For example, Lemco, you could be a Lemco born in America, no exposure to the alphabet, but now you can plug it into our program and you can see roughly what it means in English. You can see how to pronounce it and you can read the letters even if you don't know the alphabet. Uh, that'll let you keep up with news and new blog posts, for example. Uh, you can even chat with people. The majority of uh, Gen Xers, for example, communicate with each other digitally as opposed to in person. So more people chat with each other than talk with each other nowadays. So these technologies can really help people from different, um, uh, keep up, uh, communicate with each other who normally wouldn't be able to. So you can text each other, email each other, comment on Facebook posts, what have you. Uh, high quality resources will soon be able to be produced quickly and cheaply, blog posts and media outreach. Uh, we'll just run it through the uh, machine and then a native speaker or an expert can just go through and make sure uh, there's no mistakes and then you can publish. And um, right now it takes enormous effort for to pay someone to write an article and then publish it. And then hopefully soon we'll be able to create a lot more content in these endangered languages. All right, and soon, New speakers are gonna be able to write using this technology. You're gonna put it in English or Polish and it's gonna come out in the endangered language, for example, Lemco. And that'll be a great writing aid for, for new speakers in the community. All right, and now let's open it up. Um, anyone have any questions or thoughts? We got one here from Sarah. Which sort of algorithms are you using to build out this system? Are there any significant libraries or tools you're using? That's a great question, Sarah. So in the back end, what we have is a Polish English neural machine translation engine. Um, that could be the Google Translate, Google uh, Cloud Platform API, for example. Facebook has an awesome engine out there. There's a lot of good 
engines out there that you can use in the back end. The current back end is Google Cloud Platform. Uh, what significant libraries and tools are using? Heaviest usage uh, would be the uh, Natural Language Toolkit, the NLTK Python library, uh, using that a lot uh, for parsing and things like that. Great question. Karen Varian, how is it translating English to Lemco? What about other dialects of Carpatho Rusin? It's using transfer learning. So to translate from Lemco to English, it's going to translate from Lemco to Polish and then from Polish to English. And that's how it's working. Uh, other dialects of Carpatho Rusin, I haven't gotten there yet, but that's in the works. Tomasz Kalinich, how would you go about further improvements? Is it primarily about training data or is there more to it? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now, I'm concentrating mostly on rule-based machine translation from Polish to Lamco and vice versa. So honing those rules and uh, the main bottleneck right now is vocabulary, just getting as much vocab stuff in that thing as possible. Uh, there's also, we could also train neural engines. We're getting to that point where we have enough data, um, but I'd rather put that off until later. Let's see, we got some more questions here. Did I get all Thomas's question? Is it primarily about training data or is there more to it? Training data helps, but right now it's about rule-based translation. Rich, Rich Custer, great to see you, Rich. Is this built robustly enough to recognize length of dialectal variants along with the codified language? I'm working on it, yeah. Uh, every time I see um, a non-standard variant or something different from the codified variant, like you see in, um, for example, Homiax grammar, uh, I code it in. So it, it adjusts for that. So if I catch it, yeah, I'll code it in even if it's non-standard, right. It's, um, it's supposed to be able to catch non-standard dialects and typos, lots of typos right out there. So I hope that answers your question, Rich. If not, we'll get back to it. Inga, great to see you, Inga. What is this accurate in, in getting flexions, genders, et cetera, correctly when translating from English? Very accurate because it's rule-based. Um, so it translates from Lemko to Polish and Polish is very structured, right? Everything's feminine, masculine, neuter. So it's, it's pretty, pretty accurate. Now going the other way, it might be harder, but so far we're doing good. Vitaly, great to see you. Thanks for coming. Would that engine cope with the Futsu dialect of Ukrainian? I don't think so, not at this point. I bet Google Translate Ukrainian English would, but this uh, wouldn't. And the reason is I don't have any Futsu data, but if you got it, or we know someone who could, uh, I'd be interested in adding that, that'd be great. Zlata, when will you have English to Lemko translation available? I'm hoping in the winter. I had something um, running in the spring that had a blue of about 19, which was actually pretty high. So uh, hopefully this winter, I'll be putting that up there for the general public to use. Frank, why did Google give him the Theophilus name, which is probably correct, but the app made it very different. Theophil, uh -huh. I wonder if Google would have had Michaelo and Yuris would have made it what? So, for whatever reason, Google is training data, um, thought Theophil and Theophilus are the same name, which is true. Um, my guess is Wikipedia. I think Google, uh, Google translates the Ukrainian English engine was fed Wikipedia articles where maybe some old Roman people named Theophilus or Greek people, and it just compared them against the Ukrainian Theophil. So I, I would blame, I would say that's about Wikipedia and Google using Wikipedia for their training data. I hope that answers your question. Let's see, Steve, have you thought about having a bot or similar that can carry on a conversation at least for the purposes of language training? Yeah, I had a primitive bot out there. Um, what I'm thinking now is to use one of the um, full-fledged English bots and hook it up to this translation engine. But we could also try to build a native Lemco bot, but I just don't think we've got the data for it. So yeah, once the, English Lemco and Lemco English legs are done. We can hook that up to a bot and it'd be pretty cool. We could even use a Polish bot actually. That would work. So uh, we'll get there. But maybe maybe, maybe next spring or summer after the uh, next one is. Maria, great to see you. How far is the jump between this tech and voice recognition? I'd imagine significant, but how are those technologies related? 
that's interesting you bring that up. Both uh, this tech and voice recognition are now uh, in the domain of AI. Uh, I consider voice recognition very similar technologies, but a little different. This is based more on uh, image recognition software that's been repurposed for language, whereas voice, trend, uh, voice recognition, I know less about that. Google has a great API, and I don't know if, I don't think the, it would work though for Lemco. Um, that'd be something to explore. We would take the audio tracks and the transcriptions and just do sequence to sequence would be my intuition about that. Uh, I think it's doable. Wojciech. Is it available for Lemco Polish Pair? That technology exists. I have it. It's running on this computer. It's actually on the server. I just haven't done a user interface for it. I'm thinking this winter I'll do it. Um, it's pretty much ready. Uh, I just want to do some final tests. But that technology, not only does it exist, it's, it's pretty much ready for deployment. Yeah. Uh, I think the Polish audience will be a little more, um, I think, accurate. I want to get the, make sure the accuracy is there because that's really important to people. But uh, it's pretty much ready. So hopefully this winter will take. That's a great question. All right. Rich, what are Google's expectations processes for adding languages to Google Translate? I do work for them on the weekend. So I don't know if I need to say that in the interest of full disclosure. Uh, my understanding of Google's processes for that is they're just going for um, to translate as much as the web as possible to help as many people as possible. And that means using the most widely used languages as possible. So I don't think endangered languages are on their radar at all. They're going for um, the most widely distributed languages and that that's their process. If they wanted to fund something like this, maybe we could ask them, we could do a grant proposal, but I don't think that would be part of Google Translate. Uh, that's just not what they're trying to accomplish. In my opinion, but um, other people might have other views on that. It's just not what they're trying to do. All right. Keep them coming. Anybody else? Tomas, would you consider repurposing your system into a browser plugin, pl plugin for reading LimFM, for example? Yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea, definitely. Right now it's just the web app, but we could definitely do like a, a Chrome plugin or something. That'd be cool, for sure. That's a great idea. People could just go to LemFM and just click a button and it would uh, automatically translate into English or Polish. That'd be pretty cool. Thank you. Sarah, you said your translation method is rule-based. Are you doing rule-based conversion to Polish and then machine learning-based translation from Polish to English? Uh-huh, exactly. So in this case, we're doing rule-based conversion from Lemco to Polish, and then machine learning-based uh, translation from English, I mean, from Polish to English. Between the Slavic languages, rule-based systems are gonna be viable. The Sylvias and the Czechs um, did a lot of work with that in the 80s. What was it called? Uh, I forget. But uh, it's viable between Slavic languages, but unfortunately not between Slavic languages and Germanic languages like English. So yeah, it's rule-based. Uh, inter-Slavically, and then it's uh, machine learning based from Slavic into English. Better. Keep them coming. Anybody else? Yes. Go for Maria. Shoot. But let me tell you, okay, you can, you can hop on. Just unmute yourself. I think you pressed the space bar. Everybody else, if you, you, you've got a window right now to type in your questions too, we'll get to them all. I get to catch my breath and get some coffee. Thomas, is English your first language? Yes, it is, believe it or not. <laughs> I was born in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, I was educated abroad in Poland and that kind of um, gave my accent a little Polish charm. Maria, what's the implication of using Polish as intermediate languages when we consider the real issues surrounding dominant languages and assimilation? Uh, 
I, you know, I don't think there's any implication. Uh, my only, my, my highest, I've got a lot of values, but my highest value in this case is accuracy. Whatever it says in Lemco, I want as accurate as possible in English translation. And however I get there is how I get there. And um, that's my highest value. Um, I'm not happy about the idea of using um, a dominant or a colonial language um, that, that, that's assimilating. It's not my first choice, but uh, if it gets us to where we need to be, then um, if, it, if it's accurate, it's accurate. Accuracy is my highest value. Um, and then, um, yeah, I want to get to a point where we can cut out that. Maria, I want to get to a point where we can cut out that leg, but I'm just not there yet. But that's the long-term goal. Thomas. My second language was Spanish. Frank, any available stock investing options before Google buys this from you? I think this is wonderful. Thank you so much for making this. You are doing such a service for people. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. My pleasure. Thanks, Maria. Anita. Hey, Antonita. What do you see the economic benefits to be? It's going to save a lot of people a lot of money. Um, translation costs an arm and a leg, and it should because it's it's a it's a highly qualified uh, time intensive process. So this is going to save people in low resource communities um, lots of money and lots of time and um, lots of capital investment. So I really hope it'll um, ungunk the system and uh, remove a lot of friction from internet um, inter Atlantic transatlantic communication in the community. Thomas said, Daku and Petro Daku. Wojtek, what about confidential, confidentiality issues and personal data processing? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up from a European perspective. If you click donate my data to science, it'll go on the logs and then we, we can use it to, um, to just see what people are typing in and um, make the engine better uh, to work on what people need. But if you don't click that, I don't log it. So. I would hope there's no confidentiality issues. It just goes nowhere, right? It's just um, it goes into the RAM and then it just gets overwritten. But uh, maybe we should talk about that with that whole uh, GDPR, right? That'd be an interesting conversation, actually. I got to um, make this Euro compliant, but I think it is. Christian, how much traffic does this solution receive? And have you had issues of scaling it up as it grows in popularity? Very cool work. Keep it up. Um, today's the debut, so we'll see. Google Translates, uh, Google Analytics is running, and um, we'll be logging that traffic to see how much it gets. Um, yeah, we're gonna encounter issues as it grows in popularity. Uh, I'm gonna move it on to AWS probably or some other cloud. Uh, thanks, great to see you, Christian. Maria, definitely can speak to the economic benefits of this. Glad to hear it. Mary Ann, do you think they should unmute themselves and ask questions directly? You're more than welcome to unmute yourself. I don't have to listen to my own voice the whole time. Sue, this is fantastic. I cannot wait to see where you take this in the next year or two. Great works. Thank you, Sue. Mike, great talk. Could this method be used for other endangered languages? Find a similar language with a large corpus, translate with methods that take advantage of that large corpus, and then use rule-based translation with the uh, endangered languages. Yes, it absolutely could. The first step would be to go out with cameras and microphones, record people talk, build up a corpus. Uh, if you're lucky, you can find a large, higher resource language and use transfer learning. Um, if you're unlucky, you're gonna have to translate all that into English and then uh, build up a bilingual corpus the hard way, which is, which is still worth it. And there's probably people out there that would fund it. It's definitely transferable to other uh, endangered and low resource languages. Douglas, are the data sets you consume for the learning contemporary Lemco text, or is it learning from Lemco text from recent history? Is it learning today's Lemco or great grandpa's? Oh, that is a loaded question. What a great one. Um, right, the data set is primarily based on interviews with people conducted in the last five years, so very recent data. Uh, we transcribed it as the core of the data. Um, LEMFM is also out there and publicly available. Uh, that's, depends on the author, but that's modern LEMCO. 
great grandpa's Lemko. <laughs> it's not Lemko, uh, unfortunately. A lot of Russian used back then. So no, I'm not using the Russian, uh, that data. I don't find it useful. I only find the, the modern data useful. Um, I'm not trying to build a Russian English translation right now. Jeffrey, spasiba, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Jeffrey. Glad you could make it. Keep them coming. Steve, very different kind of questions. Feel free not to answer if not right for this forum. How aware are everyday Russians, Ukrainians, Czechs, and, and Slovaks that Lemko and Rusin exist? Do other efforts exist to automate translation? Yeah, in my experience, Russians and Ukrainians aren't aware Lemko exists, but some people in Ukraine know. Uh, Czechs and Slovak more, because the old Czechoslovakia, right, was tripartite, uh, Czech part, Slovak part, and the, the Rusin part. So a lot of people in, in Slovakia know, and at lesser extent in Czech Republic. Do other efforts exist to automate translation? Not that I'm aware of. I think this is the only one. Christina, we're very aware. Smile. That's great, Christina. I stand corrected. Very, very... Are you, Inga, Ukrainians are very much aware of Rus and Lemko. Wonderful. Okay. I stand corrected. That's that's good news. Yeah, sometimes I talk to people from Russia and they're like, huh? <laughs> Steve, great. And thanks. My pleasure, Steve. Thanks for joining us. Nice to meet you. Keep them coming. Don't be shy. You can even unmute yourself. Give a spiel if you want. We got lots of talented people from all over the world on this call. Uh, it'd be great to give a lot of people's perspectives. Pete, would you be willing to give this presentation to our genealogy group? Absolutely, it'd be my pleasure. Tim, I'll reach out to you. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Catherine, this could be so great for translate old records to learn about ancestors. Yeah, the problem with old records is, is normally, um, which is another domain of machine learning, yeah. um, it's text recognition, right? The handwriting recognition is very difficult, but there's great technologies out there that are coming online. Yeah, the Please scripts. Feel free to un unmute yourself and talk to Pete directly. It um, would make it easier for you. Yeah, the handwriting recognition is the hardest part about old letters and old records. Uh, but there's great, great technology that's just, just, just in its infancy right now for that. So if we can combine those two, that would be great. Thanks, Catherine. Glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for coming. Anybody else? Well, I'll stay on the line. Um, he might not understand the Pittsburgh accent. So I'll stay on the line. Um, and if anybody wants to chat or talk or has a question, um, I'm here. Wondering if you've published any papers on this approach. Yes, Sarah, I've got a paper coming out next month. Uh, I'll be sure to get you a copy. Uh, I'm doing a presentation in Orlando on it uh, at the end of next month, and the paper will be published in as well. Frank, so for handwriting, a two-step process, right, of OCR software first. Right, Frank, we need the OCR software, and I'm sure it's out there. I just haven't gotten into it. Sure thing, Sarah. Get, um, I'll be sure to get your email. Inga, of course, yeah, I'll get, your paper, I'll get you a copy of the paper and a link to it. I'll get you a preprint. And then the official one will be next month, and then you can cite it in your work. Sarah, does anything like Tesseract recognize Cyrillic? Uh, of course. Um, I, as far as I know, Tesseract does not do Cyrillic handwriting, though. And um, most of the records these people are talking about are, are handwritten, unfortunately for us. Thomas, can you say a little something in Lemko or Rusin to us to hear your accent? Um, Gotcha. 
This is amazing. <laughs> totally, totally. Wow, it's great to see all these people here. Yeah, so I'm going to stay on the line uh, until it's over. And uh, meanwhile, anybody jump in? Optical character recognition, that's right. OCR, you got it. We got to get Mike on here. Mike, uh, Mike knows a lot about that. You know, we need this handwritten optical character recognition, that's right. Or a good typist. My pleasure, Catherine. Great to see you. It's, Anita, it seems you could improve on non indigenous language conversion as well. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of room for improvement in that. That's right. A lot of work to be done. Thomas, can you describe the difference between rule based learning versus others? Sure can. So rule-based machine translation is the old school where you just have basically mathematical rules. If X, then do Y, and you just code them by hand. It's very laborious and time consuming, but it's worth it for uh, translating between Slavic languages. Um, and um, machine learning is basically just um, brute forcing it. So it just takes the input text and the output text and just does millions and millions and millions of guesses until it finds the happy path. So it's a completely different approach. Whereas rule-based is where you have somebody that knows the rules, write the rules, and, uh, and do that manually. And machine learning is having a, a machine do that automatically. The code, the, yeah, I'm not familiar with the, yeah. Mm -hmm. lots, of, lots of opportunities out there. Maria, yes, but the difference is that those languages have the whole power and financing of Google and others behind them. Lesser spoken languages do not have that. Very true. Maria, yes, many, but not all. Anna, my pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Great to see you. Yeah, maybe we could write some grants to Google or something for them to fund stuff like this. You never know, they might be interested. Douglas, are there parallels to your work outside your specific Slavic language expertise by other language group experts, Native American languages, or even Created uh -huh, out languages like Klingon, for example. I'm in a couple of Native American language groups, but I haven't worked on that language revitalization. All my experience is basically within Slavic language, the Slavic language family, uh, unfortunately, at this point. But um, I look forward to working with other communities on uh, with these technologies, and uh, I'm sure we could all benefit. Klingon, now that would be a project. That could be fun. I think it'd be fun to create an English Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit um, machine or an English Latin one. That would be fun. I think Google actually has a Latin one. That's pretty cool. You type in English and it spits out Latin. That's, that's really cool. But that's not machine learning based. So it's still the phrase based one, the Latin one. That's the only one. So that'd be, that'd be cool to work on. Thomas. Where is most of your heuristic data crunching needed? Rule-based from Lemco to Polish or Polish to English? Sounds like it's the latter machine learning process. Your data crunching, ironically enough, is with the rule-based. Why? Because you don't want to waste time. So the first thing you're going to do is sort every uh, token by frequency. And you're only going to concentrate on the most frequent tokens. Otherwise, it'll just be on this wild goose chase that'll never end. So I crunch the data for the rule-based translation so I don't waste my time and I only concentrate on the, the most frequent words. Um, machine learning, eh, not so much. That's a good question. Keep them coming hard and fast. Right. How many if then statements do you have to cycle through for a typical translation? Um, I, I would say thousands at this point, thousands. It'll go through maybe, um, I haven't counted the, the number of loops in there, but um, probably in the thousands and it, it's just instant. It still does like 40,000 words a, a, sec, uh, a minute, an hour, which is pretty amazing. Tomasz, I might have misremembered, but I think there's a new Lemko Polish dictionary in the works, yeah. 
Would something like that be helpful for the Lemco translator? Absolutely, absolutely. That would absolutely be very useful. Uh, right now, using uh, Horushek's Horushek dictionary from from 2004, which is which is very helpful. But the new one would definitely be even even more helpful. If we could digitize that, it would be golden, right? And then sort it by um, stem type. That would be absolutely helpful. Rich, among L native speakers, linguists you've worked with by profession has expressed the most interest in this. Is this Lemko Polish inherently the basis of this? I'm not sure I follow. Um, I, yeah, I think most interest has been from Ukrainian linguists, I would say, and to a lesser extent, Polish linguists. Um, is Lemko Polish inherently the basis of this? So Lemko Polish is a very important pair for this. Um, it's the basis of a lot of things. Maria says it's already digital. What? Oh, that's great. We got to talk. Anita, English seems far from rule based. This must be a deep learning curve. Yeah, definitely deep learning between English and Slavic languages. And I was trying to type something in. It would be useful to see what I typed in redisplayed. I made some typo and be nice to copy paste and correct. Oh, OK. Yeah, we could add that, like um, where you put in the input. We could definitely add that. I was trying to save screen space, but we'll, we'll, we'll draw up a ticket to put that back in because that would be useful. You're right. It does show what you put in, but transcribed right into the Latin alphabet. So I don't know if that's useful or not. Uh, Rich, L is Lemko. See, does that change? Among, among Lemko native speakers, linguists you've worked with, ah, who by profession, who by profession is, I'm not quite following. Um, yeah, most interest is coming from, from linguists in Poland, I would say, and to some extent from Ukraine. Jeffrey, thanks for sharing your work. This has been very interesting for me as I've been learning Slovak for two years, but I'm also a PhD student, PhD student at CMU in, uh, I guess that's Carnegie Mellon University in language technologies. It's great to see these technologies being applied to endangered and low resources languages. Thank you for joining us, Jeffrey, and uh, thank you for your kind words. Um, look forward to working together. Rich, I meant, do journalists see the most use for this or language teachers? Sorry for not making myself clear. Yeah, I work for a, a corporation right now, so I haven't been reaching out to, to journalists because it's just a lot of paperwork. Um, I have spoken with um, a Rusin journalist and that was a good interview. I'll have the English up soon so you all can read that. But I've been kind of um, avoiding speaking with journalists just because of the red tape involved because I got to like, you know, translate it and then declare it. And it's just a lot of work, but um, it's common. It's common, the, all the press releases. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. M maybe we have journalists here. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. Rich, this is, um, maybe I didn't make this. I think he's asking, who do, who do I think will use this? Uh, this particular model I see being used by Lemcos born in the United States and born in the United Kingdom who want to read in their heritage language. Uh, we're going to be rolling out the, I'm going to be rolling out the Polish pretty soon. And so I see that used by Lemcos born in Poland who weren't taught Polish at home and want to read in their heritage language. I hope that helps. If not, we'll get to the bottom of this. I got all night. <laughs> Rich, does that help answer your question? <laughs> Okay, Rich, this is the uh, the, the uh, worldwide premiere of it. So um, it's been under wraps until tonight, basically. And still will be, unless there's journalists here, who knows? What was that guy's name? I forgot. All right, keep them coming. The journalist's name was Mihai, Mihai, Mihai something. When is your next webinar? Uh, I think we're gonna work with Marianne on doing it for the genealogy group. So I don't know when that'll be, but hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. 
Marianne, are you planning to write an article for Lemco and Roos and Newsletters? Yes, I'm writing an article for the new Roos and Times. So hopefully that'll be out soon as well. Tomas, Mihai Lizichko, he is the author of a tech blog in Roos. Yes, or rather the tech blog. That's right. I've got an interview out with, uh, with Mihai Lizichko that you can read in Rusin, and I've got the English translation. I'll be publishing that soon. So everyone else can read that article. Uh-huh. That's the only press interview so far. Tomas, if the recording will be made available, other journalists will surely react in due time. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Lots of red tape, but it'll be worth it. Yeah, we're going to get this out on YouTube, hopefully. So everyone will be able to watch. Frank, I will try use, I will try to find relatives that were sent to Tenopio and chatting with them to yeah. Yeah, definitely. You can chat with people in their own native language. That'd be great. Thanks, Tomas, for reminding me. I couldn't remember his last name for the life of me. I think it's a pseudonym, but I'm not sure. Zlata, thank you so much. My pleasure, Zlata. Thank you for uh, for joining us. Great to meet you. Well, I'm going to stay on the line until the last person leaves. So um, don't be afraid to turn on your mic to unmute yourself. And uh, or just type away. Well, that was a lot of fun, guys. I'm just saying thank you. Oh, great thank you. Me. Who's that? Car Carlos. Carlos. Hey, yep. great to see you. Likewise. All right, thanks a lot. Have a good night. Enjoy you too, time. Carlos. Thank you. Inga, thank you. I hope it was a very interesting session. Hope to hear more about your work. My pleasure, Inga. Thank you for joining us. Great to see you here. Frank, I think you should celebrate with some whiskey and I could check. <laughs> what if I could? <laughs> Karen and Danny, great to see you guys. Thanks for joining, Karen and Danny. I hope to uh, be out maybe in Pittsburgh or out west soon, so maybe we can hook up. Doug, Douglas, this is great. A good model that can be extended to other native languages. Yes, for sure. My pleasure, Doug. Thank you for joining us. Miss Marianne, thanks for the great presentation. My pleasure, Marianne. Great to see you. Great to see you. Bogdan, thank you. Thank you, Bogdan. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Sarah, thank you. Very interesting. Well, thank you, Sarah. Gina Robert Shaw. Thank you. I'm glad, excited and plan to put this to good use. Yes. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> hey, what's up, Chris? We're going to hang out. Good to see you. Where do you work and live? I'm in Annapolis, Maryland. So anybody is in town like Chris, uh, we should catch up, let me know. So I'm in Annapolis, Maryland. Yeah, Chris, you're in Baltimore, that's right. John Beerus, thank you. My pleasure, John. Yeah, man. Definitely, Chris. Frank Mosca, how long have you been working on this project? It's been on the burner a couple of years, I would say. A couple of years it's been on the burner. This is basically, uh, I used to do a lot of Lemco to English translation work, and this is basically automating that work. So it's been on the, on the back, on the, on the burner for a while. Sometimes on the back burner, sometimes more on the front burner, middle burner. We'd love to see you present this at West Virginia University. Yeah, I'd love to. That'd be great. <laughs> Will this be on YouTube? Yeah, hopefully. If everything went, if went smoothly, it'll be on YouTube. Uh, I think it's recording right now. Could you point us to the channel? Yeah, uh, well, I'll send you guys the link. As soon as we get on YouTube, you'll be the first to have the link. I think we have, we, we've got your email addresses and uh, yeah. Frank, like most inventions, the impetus was to help save you time and effort ultimately, yes? Yeah. 
Yeah, the name of the game is to automate your job, right? <laughs> John Virosh, what software are you using? It's my own custom software that I wrote using Python. Um, this is a little bit from the NLTK toolkit, but mostly it's custom software I wrote. Nita, thank you, great presentation. Great to see you, Antonita. John Vitos, you did this in Python? Yeah, this is all in Python. Uh -huh, the whole thing is in Python. But the front end, front end uh, uh, graphical user interface is in PHP, and then the back end is all, all in Python. <laughs> yeah, Python's pretty cool. You can do a lot of stuff with it. I tried JavaScript for a while, but it's not going to work. <laughs> Only Python. JavaScript, it's just, it's not that good for language. It doesn't have the uh, negative look behinds, which is why I ended up with Python instead of JavaScript. Otherwise, it could have been like running the browser. That would be pretty cool. You need, we need to get you to teach us a course in Python. Yeah, we should do it. We should do it in Lemco. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Learn Python in Lemco. We should definitely do something like that. <laughs> Tom Weller, great to see you, Thomas. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your presentation. My pleasure. Great to see you. The next generation of digital native Lemcos, all with coding skills. Yeah, yeah, Frank. It's the name of the game these days. That's right. That would be great. Tomash, this is the current trend in endangered language for revitalization. Would be great to see it happen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a lot of work to be done with Python and teaching people to code and uh, saving our endangered languages. You guys get your work cut out for you over there in, in, in Zakarpatia. Voite, thank you for invitation and your great effort. I think it could be a good idea to give this presentation for a Polish audience. For example, during the KTLC conference. I would love to Wojciech, that would be wonderful. Great idea. I, I'll be sure to check out that link. I'll be more than happy to give a presentation for, for Polish audiences. Uh-huh. I miss Poland, I would love to go back out there. Oh, I miss that country, wow. <laughs> I lived in Krakow forever, it was awesome. Tomasz, thanks for the presentation, it was wonderful and a pleasure to be here for the premiere. Thank you for joining us, Tomasz. It's, it's like 1 a.m. in, in uh, where, to, where Tomasz is in Usro. Thank you for joining us and staying up all night to, uh, to be here for the premiere, we really appreciate it. And um, I know you're doing a lot of great uh, linguistics work over there, I see it on Twitter sometimes. Uh, looking forward to working together more. Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to stay on the line. I know some people are shy and uh, want to wait until it's uh, more private before they ask their questions, and that's fine too. Catherine, thanks again. My pleasure, Catherine. Thanks for joining us. Catherine Starchich, start. How do you pronounce that? I wonder. KTLC conference. That looks cool. <laughs> Kareen, thank you. This is very exciting. My pleasure, Kareen. Thank you for joining us. Great to have you here. John Biros, we should have this presentation in Krakow. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm for that. Let's do it. Beautiful city. I bet a lot of you have been. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, good to see you, John. I see you right there. Got your camera on. That's cool. Nice job, Pedro. You're doing a great work. Seriously, great work, man. There's a lot of. Yeah. I need. I need to talk to you one day. We need to have a couple of beers together. In Sounds Krakow good. would be. In Krakow would be absolutely perfect. You know. <laughs> we could drag Marianne there too. It's we could drag her there too. You know. So she, Let's she can it. always go to sleep, go to sleep in, in Yakubari, so we don't, have <laughs> we don't even need a hotel for her, you know. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you. I need a, I'll talk to you. I'll get in touch with you later, but great job. Thank you very much.
Sounds good, John. We'll talk. Great to see you. Yeah, Pete, if you can do the our article for the winter um, issue of NRT, because this is my, I'm done in December as president. So I would like to, um, our final issue will be um, coming up, I guess, in January. So I would like to put that in. And also Sharon Jero, she's our uh, genealogy chair. And I was telling her about you and she's very much interested in giving a presentation, to, you know, so, um, yeah, I would like to do that soon too. So, I'd be delighted. Sure, I'll have that article yeah. to you soon, and uh, I'd be delighted to give the presentation to the genealogical group. Yeah, yeah. And there's also, um, I don't know. Well, there's a Czech genealogy group in Ohio, and I wonder whether they may be interested. I'll I'll follow up. I'll I'll contact them. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. This was really great uh, presentation. I do want to tell you, I mean, this is fantastic. Something new, you know? Thanks, Maria. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for organizing it, making this all possible. My pleasure. Any more questions for Pete? Please unmute yourself. There's only 16 of us, so we can chat if you wish. Mike says, great work, eye-opening the possibilities. Cheers. Thanks, Mike. Good to see you here, bro. Thanks for joining. You're a quiet bunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, your well, material is so new, I think, you know, but um, it's fascinating. I mean, you know, you're a scientist. We don't have many, many scientists. I mean, that we know of, but so this is great. Yeah, I'm really happy to be uh, published in um, Peer reviewed journal next month, scientific journal. It'll be fun. Yeah. Giving a presentation. Can you send us a link? Is it going to be digital? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it'll be available online for a couple of months. They might put it behind a paywall afterwards, but it'll be. Yeah. Can, you send me, uh, can you send me the link when you get it? Of course, of course. Okay. That's good. I think the first week of December it'll be published officially. Yeah. So and everyone can cite it in their papers. Thesis. Okay, um, anyone else has any questions for Pete? The Serbs have guessed Louis. Thank you, Frank. Just that was one cool dude. <laughs> one cool dude. That's true. Oh, we got Ivan here. Great to see Ivan. Wojciech's here. Those are some great. We got to talk Wojciech about the, the, mm. that stuff. Dale. Uncle Sonny's here. Mom's here. <laughs> Antonita's here. Your mom is here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hello, Mrs. Gleason. <laughs> Ivan's here. Good night, Wojciech. It's like 1 a.m. or what's it? Thanks for joining us, even though it's so late over there. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Rich, I think you had a question, but oh. I don't know if I answered it right. Go ahead. Off topic. Um, what in the background is fascinating. Yeah, that is pretty cool. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Pete, did you ask me to like repeat my question? You had this question and then Maria like reframed it. I don't know, did I answer your question or did I? Well, I guess basically like, what is the use case or cases for this as you see it and as you have heard from other people that you've worked with on this, you know, from, from the native Lamco speaking community who, you know, you recorded and everything. 
and I assume that they were somewhat aware of what you were working on. So, you know, what do you see as the primary uses of this other than, you know, Americans of Lemco heritage? Because to be honest, I don't see that as a very large base from which to justify a project like this, which laudable as it is and amazing as it is, and I am thrilled that you have done this. Um, you know, I, I'm skeptical about, you know, I think, I think right now we have so many baby boomers that are doing genealogy and they have letters and this, um, this software would really help them. I mean, we, um, to have a translator, but somebody is prohibitive and this way um, there are a lot of people um, that, that they would be interested in this uh, app, at least from my experience. Yeah, and Rich, to answer your question, I think uh, native speakers of Lemco, you know, who grow up speaking the language from their parents or even instructing the language, they don't need apps like this, right? They're, um, they can already speak Lemco. They don't need um, comprehension aids. They don't need writing aids. This is for people who didn't grow up speaking Lemco or did speak Lemco, but weren't formally instructed in the language. And this is a reading aid for people like that, whether they're born in Poland. Um, and that I would, that I'm thinking tens of thousands of people of Lemco descent born in Poland who um, could use this this app to translate from Lemco into Polish and from Polish into Lemco. Um, in the United States, there's probably probably hundreds of thousands of people of partial Lemco descent who could benefit from this technology. I mean, when you once you factor in, but my point is descent. those mm -hmm. the the overwhelming majority of those people would either not have any interest in such a thing or would not be aware of it. Well, yeah, but I mean, um, a small percentage of 100,000 is still a lot of people. Comes in. I mean, even the people who are really engaged have, in my experience, at least online, um, they you know, have very little interest in learning the language. Well, I would those hope, think mm -hmm. that they do generally, um, you know. The... I think things are changing. I think it's hip and cool. Go ahead. My experience. So I brought up journalists because it occurred to me that, you know, a Polish journalist writing about Lemko's might use this to translate, you know, Lem FM stories or Radio Lemco stories, you know, although Radio Lemco does parallel Lemco Polish already in at least- Absolutely. Very short bits, but- um, Yeah, that's a use case, sure. Well, there's hundreds of thousands of um, Rus and Americans, if not millions of Rus and uh, all over the world who could benefit from technology like this. Um, so I respectfully disagree. And the hardcore of people who uh, identify as Lemko and speaking Lemko on the Polish census, we're talking about 6,000. That's not a lot of people. So I think, I think the potential audience here is uh, in the millions and just a small percentage of that would uh, be more than enough to um, make it a success. I think um, in addition, there's like old books um, uh, when they were being printed in Lemko. And I know like um, right now there's this museum in Slovakia, it's called Kasikarda, and uh, they want uh, any material Slovak or Rusin that was published, printed in America. And we have some of the documentation that down the line will need to be translated. And having something like what you're doing would be tremendously helpful uh, to um, uh, to kind of revive some of the uh, publications that uh, have been done. I'm talking about at the turn of a century, um, you know, that uh, kind of have been lost because people lost language ability. And so um, revisiting it now, um, 
uh, I think would be um, very beneficial, not only like to individual, but I, th I think also to organizations and societies and also academia, because for example, at Pitt, we have a department less commonly taught languages. And um, uh, this type of app would be tremendous, is tremendously helpful. And as you know, you had linguists here from Pitt joining you. So, you know, they're very much interested in uh, what you're doing. Yeah, that's great. There's a lot of people interested in the topic. Gina, I'm still trying to learn and understand Lemco. I think many of us would be, but we never had a reliable source to turn to, right? There weren't the resources out there. It's a very low resource language, unfortunately, but uh, that's improving. Yeah, Pete, Good so I you. asked you that question before the, um, re, uh, before the session, but can you just for the audience, um, tell us the difference between Rusin and Lemco, just so that there's a clarification on that. I mean, uh, you know, just for people to know. Right, so you've got a lot of um, East Slavic dialects in today's Poland and Slovakia. Uh, Lemko generally refers to those that use the word lem instead of uh, toko to mean only, for example. Um, spoken mainly in Poland and to some extent in Slovakia. What I'm concentrating now is the um, variant of that spoken around uh, Krakow, the Krakow region. There's other regions, there's other variations, but right now that's the one I'm concentrating on. Because so, in, in mm -hmm. my village, Nyakubanevi use a lemma a lot. You know? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And we are considered lemkos mm -hmm. also, even though I'm in Slovakia, this lemko uh, word has, has dropped and it's used Rusin, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. in the village they say, yeah, we are lemko, we are lemko Rusins. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot of different definitions of Lemko out there, right? People draw these, these maps with uh, these boundaries and, and they're all different. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And then there's like the, um, the Hutsuls and uh, the Boykos and Lemkos and, and where exactly to draw those lines is, is uh, very complicated. It's an interesting topic. So. It's kind of controversial even. Yeah. <laughs> Frank, there are so many books I'd love to read if they can only be translated for me affordably. I quit a Lemco school after program in New York when I was a child because I simply could not read anything and had no starting point. If I had side-by-side -side translations, it would be, have been more palatable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hopefully this app will give you a fighting chance. You can paste the text in, get a rough idea of what it means and um, keep chugging along. Yep. Yeah, I don't know if we're gonna be at the point where machine learning can translate entire books or fiction um, like it can maybe for English Spanish. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's going to happen, but it'll at least uh, give people a chance, a fighting chance to learn their own language. Some of the translations now for like French, English, Spanish, English, the, the, the new neural engines are just, it's incredible. Yeah. But, but for, for Slavic languages, Polish, Ukrainian, Lemko, it's, it's it's gonna take a while, if ever. Yeah. Did you did you read the book History of the English Language? Which one? Um, by Bill Bryanson. Uh, I uh, hold on. It's uh, it's the third edition uh, by uh, Thomas Gable. Oh, I haven't read that one. Yeah. I love yeah, uh, etymology. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, in here he says that uh, you know the English language is changing so much that uh, some of the poets were commiserating that um, you and know page two sixty. Yeah, on page two sixty, and it says that um, uh, that you know um, if you want to write poetry or so that you should maybe write it in Latin or Greek because the language keeps changing. And oh, that, really? He's afraid that they may not that. Uh, in 100 years, people may not understand the English phrases that they are using. So this is like uh, in correlation what you, um, you know, what you're doing. So you know, here. that it's important, you know, to have that translation and have it available to is people. Is Lemco a living language? Huh? Is Lemco a living language? Yeah. I mean, Lemco is a living language, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So. 
6,000 people uh, speak it as the primary language at home uh, in yeah. Poland, if not more. We'll get the official count in January. Right, right. Yeah, well, what I'm referring to is to what extent do words from other languages come into yeah. Lemco? Yeah, there's a question here my husband is asking to, to what extent um, do the foreign language, uh, do the foreign words um, enter into the uh, Lemco language? So, for example, you know, like Polish or Slovak or whatever, to what extent? Yeah, we're picking up tons of Polish interference, so much so that we have to code for the whole Polish language almost, like um, mm -hmm. tons of Polish interference. But uh, the engine's dealing with it, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Do you do research? Do you go back to, um, let's say, at the turn of a century? Because, for example, I learned to speak Russian here in America from my grandfather. And when I go to Slovakia, they tell me that I speak very archaically. Mm. <laughs> you know, the, the, because the words that I use, they no longer use. They kind of assimilate that they're using Slovak. It's like uh, the people, who, immigrants who came here, and they begin to mix English with, a, um, with their uh, or native language. Yeah, unfortunately, I use only the, the most modern stuff. And the reason is the old stuff, it's just too much um, Moscow Russian mixed in that I just kind of find it um, yeah. not helpful, right? Because it's not used in, in, in Poland anymore. People don't speak Moscow Russian. People don't know those words. Right, it's, right. it's not useful. But uh, there's a lot of imagine, Moscow Russian. <laughs> right. And I imagine that the new words are being uh, used as the current words are the same, like computer or uh, whatever so they are the same because uh, um, is there a, is there a school where they're creating new words in Lemko for example like I'm saying this for example when Czechoslovakia was created and Czechs decided to purge uh, the Czech language from uh, from German because for example the uh, uh, for air, they uh, they used the word Luft, which was the German. And so yeah. they decided to change that. So they took it from Russian, Vazduch, and they they, uh, huh. they, turned, it, they turned it into Vzduch, which is huh. eliminated a vowel. And uh, I wondered whether there's um, there are scholars, uh, Lemko scholars that are um, uh, creating new words as such in Lemko. In my experience, in that case, they would they would uh, borrow from Polish and use the Polish word. Mm -hmm. So, uh, computer for a computer, for example, right? So, they would use the Polish word. Yeah, I borrow think the same thing is in Slovak. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that, like in Slovak language, they use a lot of English words, you know, and they convert them into um, Slovak. For example, the word buggy, they ch they changed it into bugina. So now bugina is uh, you know, it's a Slovak word and it's a Russian word, but, but it's uh, derived from the English word buggy. Interesting. Some, Some authors, they use uh, the, the bar from Ukrainian, from standard Ukrainian. I used to see that a lot, but uh, it's a good question. Yeah, it would be interesting to know. I mean, um, does the Jagiellonian University have a, um, a Russian chair or a Russian language that they teach? I mean, Lemko. Um, the Russian department, not the, the East Slavic philology department had um, a L Russian plus Lemko teaching um, program, mm -hmm. but I think they cut it like two years ago and it was chaired by uh, Dr. Olena Oh well, Yeah. I think you know her. Yeah. 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 She was my Russian teacher for a little bit. Okay. okay. Yeah. Is she retired now or? No, no, I don't think so. Still teaching? Okay. They're, they're doing that, uh, that new dictionary, I think, that Maria was talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have more questions for Pete? Frank had some. I was going to ask you what you thought the etymology of the Lenko dialect was. Have you ever heard anyone look into whether or not we may have some connection to the Dashians? That's the theory I have. Yeah. Um, so that's, Frank, that would be what's called the, uh, the Black Theory, right? Was that, that Lemko's. Um, part of this continuum population migration from the Carpathian Mountains and which is what used to be Hungary and is today Romania and, mm -hmm. and that there's um, some influence there or mixture there with Ukrainians and Transcarpathia and then they move further west into the mountains uh, the Vlach theory migration 
could look into that if you want. Have a field day with that. I haven't looked into that much, but it's interesting too. There's only like a couple Romanian words in Lemco. So the most famous one I think is Vatra, yeah. which is like a campfire is a Romanian word, as far as I understand. Yeah. And I know that uh, in Jacoban is some of the names of the mountains uh, when, when, uh, when they came, uh, some of the people when they came from uh, Romania, like the word Kechera, they found out it was Romanian. Oh. And the, and the word Simini. Um, uh, so that these are the uh, some of the words that were still left uh, uh, from when the Valachs, I guess, came to uh, to that region. Yeah, mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah, I just found out recently that uh, the church in Yakubani, you know, so that uh, the cultural center that we have, the former Saint John Byzantine Catholic Cathedral, uh, was uh, was done by Titus de Babula. And I just found out that the church in Yakubani and Debrets and the same, their same architectural design were done by his father, Babula. Huh. So wow. I find it fascinating. I'm going to write an article about that. Cool. That is fascinating. Hmm. Okay. Do you have more questions for Pete? Speak yeah. now or forever hold your peace. Gina Robert Shaw. Hey Pete, this is Frank. I won't type now. Oh, okay, what cool. Is, Go what's ahead. your the, what's your theory about what the etymology is? Uh, based on um, all you've done. Like the like the history of a particular word or the history of the people? Uh, no, or? just the, the the dialect and because it is different. Oh. Well, I mean it was definitely um, like very similar, if not the same, as Rusin has spoken in Slovakia today at, at some point. Uh, but there's definitely been a lot of Polish influence over the last couple hundred years. Um, so I think Lemko, yeah, is a, is a Ruthenian language heavily influenced by Polish that probably had origins in what's today Ukraine, or Transcarpathian region of Ukraine, uh, I right. guess. And and now it's it's still ever changing because of of where it is you're saying with the Polish uh, influence. But I'm I'm curious about all the people that were sent to Ukraine, like Chernobyl. They would have maybe if they kept the language alive, they would have Ukrainian influence on the way they speak their dialect. I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I wonder what you think. You know, I haven't been exposed to Lamco as produced um in today's ukraine um and so i can't comment on that but that's a i'd be very interested to know about that yeah and in, in 2010 um uh, uh, we went to uh ukraine from poland to ukraine and we we were interviewing uh people who uh, witnessed Aksia Wisła, the, the forceful deportation of lemkos um to ukraine and um i was the translator and the only language that I could do is Rusin. And all those people were saying that I speak just like their parents and that, um, uh, and that but they kind of assimilated into the Ukrainian culture that they spoke uh, Ukrainian because they said when they came and they spoke uh, Lemko or Rusin that people were making fun of them saying that they speak Polish. And so, uh, you know, the, I guess their, uh, their inclination was, but they did say that the, um, uh, their parents, because most people that we had a chance to interview uh, were in their 80s, but at the time when they were forced to go to Ukraine, they were eight or nine. So they just kind of remember, you know, like in general. But that's one thing that they remembered. They said that um, the way I spoke was exactly the same way as their parents. Were, were there any transcripts from your interviews? Yeah. Um, yes, actually, we did. Uh, we, we, we taped all those um, interviews, and uh, we are turning it into a book. Um, and yeah, we, we still have the original uh, uh, video uh, the recording. And we also videotaped as much as we could. But we oh, went to, yeah, we went to um, Nadvirnam, uh, um, 
Kaluj um, in ivano frankivsk area. And uh, it, it was an, um, it was uh, fascinating. It was truly fascinating. And that's one sign that the, the whole plan of, of the operation actually worked because they diluted our people in there and then the, the other ones in Western Poland. And they yeah. somewhat accomplished what they wanted to, but I think Peter is going to help us stop that. <laughs> that's right. Well, there's nothing um, more important than learning and researching <laughs> and, um, you know, um, and moving forward in, in that field. And I think because of communism, where uh, Russians were not allowed to exist, a lot of um, a progress, everything kind of stood still. So we have a lot of work to do in order to um, kind of um, make people aware and, uh, and show them that there's a rich history and rich um, uh, uh, literature and, and art uh, that has not been explored. And um, what Pete is doing is helping that effort. I don't know whether you said uh, the Slovak Ministry of Culture asked me to do uh, English subtitles for a documentary on uh, um, artists in Subcarpathia, you know, Podkarpatska Rus. And um, uh, we found it fascinating the, um, uh, how creative those artists were um, when they were uh, a allowed to thrive under the uh, Czechoslovak government at that time. And mm -hmm. in 20 years, uh, they produced some fascinating work. And I think the same thing goes for Alemkos in, uh, in the Southern Poland and, uh, you know, in, and uh, uh, Rusyns in Eastern Slovakia. And by the same token in Hungary and, uh, and Romania as well. Yeah, I think you're correct. It's like that, uh, uh, that author who said that you need a room of one's own in order to, to make art. And so yeah. it's the same idea. Yes. Well, I can tell you when, um, um, uh, uh, when I approached, uh, uh, when Pete got, um, got in touch with me about giving this presentation and I went to, um, I use this, which is University Center for International Studies, because I worked at the National Art Rooms and at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, I made the first introduction um, with uh, um, a colleague of mine, Susan Dawkins. And when I told her about Pete, she was, she couldn't wait to meet him. And then we had a Zoom meeting and she was so fascinated by his um, introduction to this program that she has enlisted the linguistic department, uh, you know, every, everybody that she could think of in addition to Russian and East Europeans studies and et cetera, because it's something so new, so unique that it not only provides an opportunity for uh, Lemkos as a such, but for other languages too, because if it is possible to do it uh, with Lemko, which is a less commonly taught language, then it's just an opening for other less commonly taught languages to um, to do that, and there may be somebody else who can do it, right? Like, for example, Basque language, right? In and um, in Spain. So, so you you are a true scientist, Pete. Okay. <laughs> We're very proud of you. The other great thing about what you've done is that it's it's going to put the power in the hands of individuals instead of waiting for one organization to translate something or put it on their website. It's like, you know, it's open source in the sense that I can now reach out to someone individually and talk to them and translate and multiply that by 6,000 and everyone's starting to talk more and that's the key it. so that's that's fantastic instead of it being all in the hands of you know a few individuals and everyone has to then subscribe to get a newsletter i mean no offense <laughs> but this is great because you're you're 
you know, you're making it viral. So that's great. To be peer to peer, right? Decentralized. Right. That's, yeah. that's what I meant to say. <laughs> Thank you. That's the goal. Yeah. You don't have to wait for the translation, which is like a filter, right? A translator or organization is kind of a filter of information as well. So it should be. So, yeah. So, Pete, so what compelled you to do this? I wanted to automate my job. <laughs> and I was, I'm a linguist, and my job was to translate things, put things into English from Russian and, and Polish and Ukrainian and Lemko into English. And I've been working to, to automate that. I saw what Google did with Russian to English and was just shocked. <laughs> uh, I worked on that project and it was just amazing. And I said, well, if we can do this for, for Lemco, that would be cool. Because I was working on Lemco projects at the same time. I was like, wow, this, this technology is amazing. It's night and day. So that's what motivated me. Yeah. How long were you in, in Poland? You were there two years or well, how long? Mm, I never counted. I mean, decade maybe if you if you add oh, up 10 all the years. years really wow maybe more who knows i've never counted maybe about 10 years okay okay wow okay so i think it's um our time is up it's about that we have for about an hour and a half so i think our zoom that sarah said it's about an hour and a half so um uh, if no one has would you like to stay on Pete or uh, can we uh, uh, adjourn the presentation it's up to you well, I think I'm a I'm a host so I can stay on until the end right I'll be on yeah. and I'll be the yeah, last man standing so okay, okay. <laughs> we get Alexander Swiss okay okay Rich thanks amazing work yeah my pleasure Rich thanks for joining us great to have you and uh, good questions very good questions and I hope I give you a good answer Christina, thank you, Pete. It was very, thank you, Christina, for joining us. Thank you for all your work. Christina worked a lot on uh, our Lemco projects on, on transcribing and translating the interviews. So I wanted to thank Christina for all of her input on that project. We're still using her work thank today. Thank you, Christina. Glad you enjoyed it. And thank you, thank you, Christina, for your help and all your work. We really appreciate it. Anita, how do different grammatical forms of mobile accents implement the time it takes to ensure the translations are correct? Yeah, we've got to we've got to um, go through and code for all those local accents and typos and rules, and it mm -hmm. takes some time, but it'll be worth it. I hope. So, uh, Pete, I'm going to log off because I have to join okay. uh, another meeting right. um, for the uh, Carpet Tourism Society. We, we have a leadership meeting. Oh, um, okay. A pleasure um, talking to you, and I'll talk to you offline. Same thing. Okay, thank, thank you, everyone. Sounds good. Take thank care. you, Marianne, for organizing it. We all Take appreciate care. it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Marianne. Pete, I'll talk to you uh, privately. Thanks. Sounds good, Frank. I like your, uh, your your avatar there. It's pretty cool with the Adidas. Oh yeah, I think I've got one of those <laughs> bit emojis. Yes, it's cool. Anyway, thank you very much, Pete. Take care. Have a good night. See you, bro. Thanks for joining us, Dale. Great job. Great. Good to see the current tech. Thank you, Dale. Glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us, Anita. Great job. Congratulations. Thanks, Anita. Great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Gina, I will log up now so you can get out of here as soon as well. I'm so grateful I've joined this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Great to meet you and thanks for, for being here. It's great to have you on. The love, the love, the love.